fantasy short stories. Of Portals and Portents by Leslie Heron. Chapter 14, and a scene. Lying face down in three inches of water, managing not to drown only by the fact that his lungs no longer worked, forced Vel to confront an ugly truth that he had long buried beneath anger and addiction, that he was paralyzed from the neck down. His brother's meddling had brought him back from the brink of death, but in truth, his very being was hostage to the whim of a computer. Every movement, every reaction, even breathing, relied on the small electrical pulses sent out by Amy. And though he mentally cried out for her to take hold, to get him free, she was just as silent as he was. Only a flickering blue screen in his cybernetic vision remained. He was helpless, a brain in a jar, taxied around by a computer. The terror of his heart and lungs shutting down took a back seat to the spiraling reality that even the simplest of movements were not him. If he waved hello, that was Amy. If he told someone how he felt, she controlled his voice. He could not sense the touch of another human unless she fed it to him. And the pain, the thing he clung to so desperately to remind him he was still alive, wasn't real. His AI had not dialed anything down. He simply had no response to any senses, every nerve in his body numb or broken. Anything he did perceive was just a subroutine of impulses that she fed to him. His heart should be racing, his lungs hyperventilating, but they couldn't. He couldn't even close his eyelids against the muddy water. He was going to die here, trapped in a machine of flesh, lost under the burning sun of a foreign world, and the kids would never know what happened to him. He would never get the chance to apologize to the most important people in his life. Vel was ready to accept his end. When he began to rise out of the water, only vaguely aware that someone had grabbed hold of him, even though he could not feel it. Strong hands spun him around, holding him upright, several feet off the ground. Unable to blink or shy away, he was forced to gaze upon the horrifying visage of whatever it was that had freed him from the water. The figure Vel had thought was Alpha had the same shining black frame, but it wasn't goo, more of a hard exoskeleton. And even though it was man-shaped, it had four arms instead of two, both sets now gripping him firmly. A pair of gleaming eyes shone out from beneath multicolored fabrics that shielded its face from the harsh elements of the desert. The creature cocked its head to one side and released a series of guttural, inhuman sounds. Okay, so he wasn't going to drown in three inches of water. But Vel was certain this creature was going to eat him. Talk about the fire and the frying pan. In the middle of his worried musings, the blue screen in his cybernetic eye flickered to black, and a blinking line appeared, followed by a series of words. Safe mode initialized, rebooting critical functions. Vel's lungs erupted with the burning pain that screamed for oxygen, and something in his body forced them to expand, hauling in a strangled gasp of air. It was like breathing through a crushed straw but he welcomed it nonetheless. Oxygen fueling his brain, he realized his artificial heart had started flowing again as well, and he could feel the hands holding him, even though it was a deadened sensation. He wanted to move, but all he could manage was a sluggish blink and a hitch in his breathing. The creature shook him, repeating the series of clicks and low thrumming sounds, but Vel's attention was pulled to the flash of movement over the creature's shoulder. He could see the queen and her bodyguard sliding down the sand dune in his direction, looking 
back and forth wildly, as though they couldn't see him. He understood why, when they passed over the threshold, the air around them shimmered and warbled. It was an invisible barrier. Pyra's eyes went wide as a massive oasis flowed into being in front of her. Her feet, burning from the brief run through the sand, touched down into lush green grass as she slowed to a stop. Where there had been only empty, heat-touched sand before was now a veritable tropical forest. Large frond trees stretched up into the sky, their thick trunks curved to accommodate the heavy fruit they bore. Beneath the shade of their giant leaves sat a glittering, pristine lake pocked with countless tiny islands, each one home to a dozen colorful tents that shone like jewels in the bright sun. And guarding the perimeter of it all were statues of gilded beetles that stood sentry every few dozen yards. Undine, however, chose to overlook the stunning beauty of it all as she scanned the horizon. Her ward would not leave without their new traveling companion, and she could not abandon the queen in the desert alone. She spotted the cranky cyborg, held aloft by a humanoid insect creature. With an annoyed sigh, she cracked her neck, left, then right, and charged, ignoring the protest from her injured knee. Pyra was pulled back to the moment when she heard the dryad let loose a feral scream and glanced over to see the towering woman rushing an even taller dark figure near the water's edge. Undine! Stop! She forced her legs into motion, running through the soft earth to reach her guardian. Selky society revolved around the ability to trade with anyone, and they prided themselves on the knowledge of cultures and languages. While it had been decades since her days in primary school, Pyra could recognize the figure standing near the water's edge. Plucked from the very pages of her textbook was a member of a long-thought extinct race of nomads that lived in the deserts, the Kivale. Alert to the sounds of her movement, the creature spun right as Ondine lunged. She threw her arms around its waist and drove it down into the muddy shore of the lake. Bell's limp form fell from its grasp, but her focus was singularly on the beast as she raised a fist. One of its forearms deflected her blow as two others struck her from the side, the force rattling her senses and knocking her to the ground. Undine! Stop! Torn between indecision and action, Pyra ran past the quarreling figures to the man lying on his side, motionless and half-submerged in the water. She dropped to her knees, grabbing his shoulders to haul him out. It was a struggle her fatigued muscles were not prepared for. He was far heavier than she had anticipated. But with some effort, she managed to pull him far enough out of the lake that he was no longer at risk of drowning. As she peered down at him, struggling to breathe as his head lay limp against her legs, she recognized that helpless look. She knew he wasn't the prince, not really. He was far too abrasive and bossy, almost verging on detestable. But perhaps she had been too hard on him. She put a hand on his face. Are you all right? When he didn't answer, she returned her attention in time to watch Ondine climb to her feet and square herself off with the cavale. Her face was bloodied, but she was in a better state than the creature, who now had a shallow fissure running along its carapace where she had struck it. If only Pyra could convince her guardian to help with Vel instead of fighting, but all thoughts of that evaporated as the nomad reached beneath a fold of its flowing robe and drew out four curved swords, chittering madly as it advanced. Please, stop fighting! Pyra could tell her words were falling on deaf ears, as she watched Ondine, the Iron Breaker, charge straight at a whirling mass of glinting steel. She looked down at Vel, noting that he was tracking her movements with one eye. The other had lost its red glow and remained stationary. Snap out of it! We need your help! Lymphatic systems resumed. Current functionality, 14%. Initiating endocrine system. Vel stared up at the woman that so closely resembled Piper. 
He wanted to console her, to tell her things would be all right, but he could do nothing except suck in another strangled gasp. The creature let out a series of noises that almost sounded pleading, protecting itself with its one remaining sword as it backed away. Undine glowered at her opponent, pulling her hand away from the gash in her side to reveal her palm stained with green blood. She let out another feral growl as she moved to one of the massive golden statues and wrenched it from the ground, straining beneath its weight as she turned to advance on her opponent. Oh, that's not good, Pyra thought. She looked down at the man in her lap, still silent and motionless. Will you be all right if I leave you here? Unable to speak or do anything, really, he managed a feeble blink in her direction, hoping she would understand that, yes, even paralyzed, he was more than capable of laying in the grass. She could see he was struggling to reply, but that response was enough to assure her he would be okay for the moment. Pera jumped to her feet, apologizing to him as she tore off after her guardian. She had to stop the dryad before she did something they could not come back from. The golden statue lay forgotten, partially buried in the earth where Undine had tried to use it to crush her opponent. Unarmed, they were now locked together, her grip straining against the creatures. She had two of its arms pulled straight out away from their body. The nomad had responded by digging one hand into the fresh gash in her side and the other wrapping stiff digits around her neck. The pain in her side was immense, so much so that Undine wanted to collapse in agony, but she pushed past it, crying out in effort as she pulled the creature's arms harder. Their thrumming, clicking speech grew ever more frantic, but she continued. And then, with a great snap, she separated one of its arms from its body, eliciting a shrill cry of pain that sounded like stones being ground together. She could end this monster here and now. That thought brought clarity to Undine, allowing her to continue pushing through the pain. Returning its cry of agony with a feral shout of her own, she shoved her boot into its chest, knocking it back. It landed hard on the ground, and she closed the distance, lifting her leg and preparing to stomp down on its head. Pyra flung herself on top of the cavale, throwing out her arms to shield the nomad with her own body. Stop! Undine stumbled back, her breathing labored. She stared wide-eyed at the woman, then at the creature beneath her. Why would you do that? He was going to kill. No! He was pleading with you to stop. He just wanted to know how we found them. Pyra peered up at the crazed, confused look in the dryad's eyes. The Cavale are peaceful. We likely could have explained what happened, but now... She stared at the arm still held in her guardian's grasp. The nomad's shrill cries gave way to a low, rhythmic humming that echoed off the invisible barrier. Bursts of ripples in the air revealed that the rising sound was coming from multiple sources. Dozens of figures, each one heavily armed, had materialized and were crying out in chorus. The sound became cacophonous, causing Pyra and Undine to double over, covering their ears. They were helpless to do anything but watch, paralyzed by agony, as the golden beetles broke free from their plinths and began to crawl in their direction. The Cavale had been hunted to extinction for a reason. They may be peaceful, but they were protected by a lost magical art, and their wrath was unparalleled something her teachings had failed to prepare her for. While he hadn't found what he had been looking for in this room, Theodore stopped to gaze in wonder at the hundreds of delicate glass orbs suspended by thin wire from gently oscillating rings. Each one had been decorated to look like a different planet, and all of them circled a large floating orb that glowed with the light of the sun. Beautiful, but certainly not what he wanted to see. Ugh, oh, damn it. He stepped out of the room, shutting the door behind him. He had given up counting how many of these bizarre workshops he had checked after the first few dozen. 
The sound of shuffling feet caught his attention, and he followed the noise. He was ready to catch that sneaky old conjurer at last, but instead was surprised by the ambling figure of an undead. One of the many soldiers that Elias had tasked with patrolling the castle, this one must have gotten lost when the pocket dimension unfolded. It gave him no notice and continued on down the hall with one broken leg. If Danny had been here, she would have guesstimated the most likely room to find the Mad Wizard in. She had always had a knack for that sort of thing. He rubbed at his sore forearm with a heavy sigh and turned his gaze down another darkened corridor. The layout of the castle was still shifting, but the order was all wrong. Doors would appear on the ceilings, beneath his feet as he walked, or scurrying off before he could open them. This task should have been a milk run for him, but despite having taken hours just to locate the gallery, Theodore found it empty. Thus the reason he was climbing stairs and scouring hallways. He had invented several new expletives, though, so he had that going for him. He followed a threadbare runner until he came to yet another door. His expectations low, he reached for it, his fingers tight around the handle. Without so much as a warning, the door took off down the hall. The jolt was hard enough to yank Theodore off his feet and send him sprawling onto the ancient rug. It reeked of mildew and tasted of moths. He hacked around the plume of dust and pushed himself to his feet, giving chase. Quit running, you stupid hunk of wood! He knew it was silly, bordering on ludicrous, to insult a door. Not like I could hear him, right? But the way it slowed down, just enough to let him catch up, and then slammed to a stop so that he would comically bounce off it, gave Theodore the impression that he had offended it. He let out a grumble as he got to his feet for the second time, rubbing his sore nose with a scowl. Unsure where he had been led, he turned his glower to the door. I hate magic. Angry that he would now have to backtrack to resume his search, he took out his frustrations with a well-placed kick against its wooden surface. As it flew open, the door retaliated by bouncing off the wall and slamming shut against his face as he tried to enter. Yeah, it could definitely understand him, he thought, as he clenched his fingers into a fist. Keep this up and I will shatter you into toothpicks. He really hated magic. The sound of shuffling feet pulled him from his threats, and he spun on his heel, expecting to see another shambling soldier. He was, however, pleasantly surprised when the frail figure of Wilfred teetered out from a frozen arch he hadn't noticed. He shot a look over his shoulder at the door behind him. You and I aren't finished yet. He shifted his attention to the old man and approached. There you are. Halfway through aggressively tearing into a hunk of his bread, the wizard froze at the sound of a familiar voice. They locked eyes, and, realizing the situation, Wilford tried to bolt. Theodore watched with slight bemusement as the frail man only made it a few feet before clutching at his sides and gasping for breath. He might have managed to evade him if he hadn't still been chained to a metal work table. Exhausted from his efforts, Wilford changed tactics. He spun, brandishing his baguette out in front of him like a weapon. Ah, the king's bodyguard. Come to finish me off? He made a lunge forward, preparing to assault the man with the baked good, but the table pulled him back. Blast this damned thing! Theodore folded his arms across his chest as he watched the old man grip the table and heave dragging the thing only a few feet into the hallway before collapsing against it. It wouldn't be that heavy if you cleared all that food from it. The table had been heaped high with wheels of cheese, jars of pickled fish, fruits, breads, and several meat pies. After a quick gulp of air, Wilford resumed his threatening stance, baguette and all. I won't go down without a fight. No, sir. Prepare yourself. Baffled, Theodore could only react with a twisted face of confusion. What are you doing? Oh, 
You mean what am I doing after you and the other two idiots left me to die? Wilford dragged himself another several steps forward. Eating for the first time in days. I would have made it here sooner if I hadn't spent several hours trying to reach the toilets. Which, by the way, turns out they are not large enough to accommodate a metal workbench. He threw an arm up behind him, gesturing off down towards a solid wall. Someone is going to have to clean that hallway, and it shan't be me. He waved his bread around again. Now, undo these shackles at once, and we shall square off in an epic battle. Theodore let out a sigh of disbelief as he raised his hands in a pacifying gesture. Hold your horses, old man. I'm just here to talk. Now... No, 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 no. We shall not resolve our issues with words, but by a duel to the death. Wilfred's voice hit a high note as the hysteria inside him reached a peak. This insult shall not stand. Taking a closer look, Theodore realized how disheveled the wizard really was. His clothes were torn and dirty. His normally wispy hair matted against his skull with a sheen of sweat and the odor wafting off him was... unfortunate. I'm sorry. You're right. Wilfred narrowed his eyes. Your trickery will not work on me, brute. Release me, or be gone. Closing the gap between them, Theodore grabbed the length of chain. Careful not to break the frail old man, he yanked, snapping the links that had been welded to the table. He looked up and waved his hands in a meager gesture. Better? Wilfred lifted his wrists. And the manacles? Theodore shook his head. I'm not about to give you back your magic, just so you can blast me through a wall or turn me into a frog or something like that. Besides, he gave a shrug. I don't have the key. I am sorry you were left alone. We weren't supposed to be gone this long. Wilfred let out a series of unintelligible grumbles before he took another bite of his whole wheat weapon. Between chews, he scrutinized the bodyguard, looking him up and down. Something was different. He was paler, if that was possible. After several moments, he pointed the bread at him again. What is it that you want? <sighs> he was so used to doing everything himself that it was difficult for Theodore to confide in others. The only person he had ever relied on was his sister. But if what was happening to him would affect her too, he wouldn't forgive himself for not doing something now to help. He swallowed his pride and wrenched his sleeve up over his elbow, exposing the wound to the wizard. What is wrong with me? His mouth opened, poised to take another bite of dried bread, Wilfred stopped. The flickering light from the candles glittered off the egg-shaped crystal jutting up from the man's skin. He locked eyes with the bodyguard and made a noise of disapproval. Well, that's not good. As one of the newcomers rushed forward, the hairy man, fearing for his life, let out a yelp and fell from his wobbly stool. He scrabbled away until his back was pushed up against the wall, and he felt the sharp steel point of a sword resting firmly on his sternum. His hand shot up into the air as he looked up. Whoa now! They say in a situation like this, the tingle some people get in the back of their necks, that gut reaction that screams, run, is tied to something their ancestors knew to be dangerous. Instincts that had been passed down from generations long gone. Beware that snake. Avoid that spider. Or run like hell when a creature smiles at you with pointy teeth. Varen's ancestors must have known this particular danger well, because whatever this man was, his entire body was screaming at him to flee, and the tremor he felt was urging him to comply but Piper had been within arm's reach of the beast. Primal fear had given way to long-forgotten training, years spent sparring with his eldest brother in his youth. 
He could now see it was simply an excuse for Lucian to beat on him, but it had left an impression, one he was thankful for as he moved without realizing, and his sword was drawn, aimed for the kill. The hairy man rose his hands above his head. Come on now, I ain't done nothing. Piper rushed to place a hand on Varen's arm, holding him back. I appreciate the white knight routine, but maybe we should think before we murder somebody? Belatedly, Varen registered what he had just done. He hesitated, a flutter in his wrist causing the sword to shake. Despite whatever urge it was that was driving him to end this threat's existence, he couldn't make that call. What if he was wrong? And the man was defenseless. He cast around the room, his gaze landing on his tiny mentor. When their eyes met, he gestured towards the stranger with a nod of his head and a silent plea. Picking up similar vibes, Evan shook his head. No, something ain't right with this guy. Better to be safe than dead, so just kill him. The stranger raised one hand even higher, as if asking a question in class. Can I... Be quiet, man bun. Piper threw an interjecting finger at the wild man before she returned her attention to the tiny merc. Sure, there's this whole murder hermit air about him, but we can't just kill people, especially if they're cowering on the floor. Look, I know you don't have to deal with these kind of things in your world, but in this one, there's an unspoken rule of the land. If it looks human, but has teeth like that... Evan paused, jabbing a finger over the stranger. It's dangerous. He motioned for Varen to get on with it. You kill him because of his teeth? Piper could feel a tickle of anger in her belly. More than once, she'd been on the blunt end of discrimination just because of the way she looked. She wasn't about to allow them to do the same to this man. Addressing the prince, she shot out the command, Keep your blade on him just in case before marching towards the merc. You can't just condemn someone to death because of who or what they are. This man, monster... Uh, actually, if I could... Whatever! Piper threw her hands up in exasperation, but her gaze landed on her brother, staring apprehensively at her, a pained look of worry in his eyes. Let's just not kill anyone until we have the facts straight. Evan crossed his arms. The facts are as follows, Missy. Creatures of the night are dangerous. Werewolves, lamias, vampires, shifters. He counted them off on his fingers. Why, you ask? Because they eat people. We are people. Sure, a kobold would eat you too, but they're dumb and recognize a pecking order. These guys? As smart as us and twice as crafty. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a meal for something that wouldn't even bat an eyelash if it murdered all of us. I don't eat people. The sound of the stranger's words drew all eyes his way. But Evan could see it for what it was and scoffed with a shake of his head. Pshaw! They all say that when their heads are on the literal chopping block. More Unsure than ever, Varen's resolve began to waver. He didn't want to kill anyone, but if the people in the room were in danger, it was his job to protect them. He looked over at his tiny mentor. I may be a werewolf, even though I honestly find that word offensive, but I ain't never eaten nobody. I've never even touched meat or eaten so much as a chicken nugget. I'm a vegan. Atticus raised a hand this time. Excuse me, Mr. Um, Lupine individual, what's a vegan? It means he doesn't eat animals. Evan pinched the bridge of his nose. No wonder he had gotten the wooblies. Throwing out an aimless gesture, the stranger clarified. Or dairy. No animal byproducts. I don't believe in the exploitation of innocent creatures. I do eat honey, though. That's where I tend to differ from other vegans. I used to work on an apiary. That's with bees, by the way. And they want us to eat their honey. In fact, they... Oh, can it? Evan waved the prince back. 
fine. I believe you, but keep it to yourself. I don't want to hear how bacon is destroying the world. Varen felt a sense of tenuous ease wash over him, and, under the direction of his mentor, took a step back, lowering the blade. Speaking of bacon, fun fact, did you know pigs can't sweat? The werewolf climbed to his feet, his hands still raised somewhat. <laughs> Wish I could say that about myself. He shifted to tug at his shirt, aerating his armpits. This whole misunderstanding has me wishing I had some deodorant. Hoo-wee! Piper pulled a face as she raised an eyebrow. Mind telling us who the hell you are? Oh, sorry. Where are my manners? Normally I introduce myself. Just, you know, nearly being skewered and all that has me all flustered. He smiled, careful not to show off his teeth. My name is Winterblade, but my friends call me Winter. Nice to meet you, Mr. Blade. Atticus tried to walk up and shake his hand, but his sister held out an arm to stop him. He scrutinized her gesture, but continued his curious questions over her shoulder. Do you live out here all alone because you're a monster like in my novels? There's a werewolf in book three, and he has to live in the woods because he goes crazy every full moon. Do you go crazy every full moon? Winter narrowed his eyes, unsure if the insult was intentional. Nah, I just popped in here to get out of the storm. I have a two-bedroom apartment I share with my wife and my pet hamster. His name is Hammy McDribbleton III. He's a rescue. I was just riding my bicycle to the farmer's market to pick up some carrots when I got caught up in this storm with all this crazy blue lightning. Then all of a sudden, there's a flash, a bright light... Next thing I know, I'm in the middle of the woods watching my bike fall down a chasm. You know, I ain't never been to the Grand Canyon before. Not even sure how I got here, to be honest. Releasing an audible groan, Evan held up a hand to get the man to stop rambling. So, you want from Avis or Ebra? Avis? Ebra? He shook his head. Never heard of him. I'm from Odessa, Texas. We thank you for joining us for this chapter of the novel Of Portals and Portents, book four by Leslie Heron in this ongoing series available here on Tall Tale TV. You can find links in the description to where you can listen to all her books and novellas, with new chapters appearing as they are being written and recorded. I say we leave him here. I mean, look at him. He's been screaming at the empty desert for over a minute straight. He is obviously insane. No, Ondine. He is Eric's brother. We can't just abandon him. <coughs> oh, look. And now he is passed out and is rolling down the sand dune like his face is a bobsled. Yes, perfectly sane. We have to go save him. Why? He can climb back up when he wakes. Well, for one, I don't even see him anymore. Ah, problem solved. Let's leave. And two, he has your armor still. Uh, damn! Fine, we rescue the idiot. Thank you, Aunt Dean. If there is even one dent in my armor, 